I'm Peter Block and it is the end of day two, Sunday, at the AHA annual meeting here in Philadelphia. And we're all here for On the Scene. With me on the far left is Deepak Bhatt from uh, Brigham and Women's in Boston. And on my immediate left, Kim Eagle from Michigan. Uh, we've done these a bunch of times before and they're always fun to do because we can go over the trials that we think are important trials, not necessarily always everybody's trial, but the ones we think are important for patient care. So I'm gonna start <clears throat> with DAPA heart failure. Uh, this is an interesting trial, elderly versus young patients uh, who are treated uh, for heart failure. Uh, Deepak, you wanna talk a little bit about this to yeah, start? Absolutely, great trial, DAPA heart failure, positive overall, showing that in patients with heart failure, it would reduce ejection fraction. And as we learned yesterday, either to those with or, or without diabetes, significant reductions in death or heart failure. Yeah, we should say that DAPA means dapagliflozin. Yes, right? dapagliflozin, SGLT2 inhibitor, conventionally thought of as a diabetes drug, but now shown to be useful in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, either with or without diabetes. Right. So that's before, that was yesterday. But what we've learned now is that in older patients, just as in younger patients in the trial, consistent benefits. So yeah. you know, it isn't right to think, oh, this person's older, you know, why am I going to start this therapy to try to prevent death or hospitalization from heart failure, and the drug seems to work really across all the subgroups they've studied, including this one. You know, older patients sometimes don't like to take their medications either, and uh, it's also nice to know that there's no downside, no negative effect about the fact that these patients are being treated as they grow older. Absolutely. Yeah. So good data. And, you know, a lot of times we ignore older patients in clinical trials, so I'm glad these folks took a good close look. Okay. So DAPA heart failure positive trial, good for anybody? Probably yeah. Put it in the water. The, the, other, the other thing is that this is like a whole new mechanism for HEFREF, right? So it, it adds to things we're already doing. And in spite of adding to those several other agents, the highly positive trial. Yeah, so, these patients were well treated with yeah, other heart failure were. meds. Yeah. So it's a good trial, and I think it's important we understand as going forward, uh, these, this new medication is going to really be a winner, I think. Okay, I think so. let's move on. Uh, we have uh, the recovery uh, trial, or not, it's actually not the recovery trial, it's the aortic stenosis trial. Uh, an interesting concept. What do you do with the asymptomatic patient who has tight aortic stenosis and feels fine? So, Kim, I'm going to throw it to you because it's a question we struggle with since I was in medical school. Yeah, it's, it's really an important question, and it comes up all the time in our clinics, doesn't it? Patients who have mean gradients of 50, uh, valve areas well under 1, we're worried about sudden death, but they don't have symptoms. And this, this is a relatively small trial randomized to surgery versus medical management and surveillance, suggesting a highly significant reduction in cardiovascular death and sudden death in the group that got surgery out at eight years. Um, I think we all sort of thought this might happen, but this is a, at least early evidence in a trial format that this is the case, that these patients that are very severe, we should consider earlier intervention. You know, I remember when I was a resident being taught by Roman de Sanctis, you were there as well. well I was Kim. there. And, uh, the days we, of giants, I would say. <laughs> absolutely. And he would say, you know, if I have a patient with aortic stenosis and a gradient of 100 millimeters, I don't care how old they are or how young they are, I'm going to fix their aortic valve. And it was just pure clinical judgment that Roman was a giant in. And it turns out he's probably right. I oh, think yeah. he is right. He is I, right. I also yeah. remember Dr. Brownwald saying that the biggest risk in a patient with asymptomatic aortic valve disease is to have surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so so go. we got two <laughs> grandfathers of the field uh, with the differing opinions. This trial is moving us in the right direction. Yeah. And we really need, I think, the TAVR trial yes. in this group to finally answer the question. Yeah. But, you know, I would point out, though, that in clinical practice, asymptomatic AS, you got to really make sure it's asymptomatic, right, because people might down titrate their degree of physical activity. So, yes. And if you throw them on a treadmill and they go two Mets, you know, maybe they're not really asymptomatic after all. So it does require some clinical acumen. No, the treadmill business is important, and we learned that in the TAVR trials. And, you know, even going back to uh, the very first tower trials, we learned that it wasn't dangerous to put them on a treadmill and right. critically important to learn what they really could do. But go cautiously. Go yes. cautiously, yes. absolutely. Yes. But don't say, no, I'll never put them on a treadmill because right. you may not learn what you need to know. To absolutely, exactly. especially if they're asymptomatic, absolutely. then why can't you put them yeah. on a treadmill? Okay, so let's go to reduce it. The third trial that we want to talk about, this is icosapen ethyl, uh, and that's another one of these sort of bombshell drugs that have recently surfaced over the last 
few years that uh, maybe we all ought to put in the water with uh, uh, our Lipitor and other <laughs> sort of cholesterol-lowering drugs. But the short version is now the question was in this trial whether or not in previous trials what we frequently have seen that the European outcomes were different than the U.S. outcomes. And the question was whether or not in this trial the same was true. Now, Deepak, this is your trial, so we didn't want you to introduce it because of bias, but tell me about the outcomes here because you yeah. know the data so well. Absolutely. So what the trial overall was over 8,000 patients, secondary prevention, high-risk primary prevention, very positive for its primary endpoints, all the components of the primary endpoint, including cardiovascular death, 20% uh, reduction, and in the trial overall a trend towards a 13% lower mortality. So that's the overall reduced trial. What we examine now was the 3,000 plus patients enrolled in the U.S., a sizable pre-specified cohort, and we examined it for the reasons you said, just to make sure the drug worked at least as well in the U.S. as outside the U.S. And what we found was indeed it did. Uh, first of all, in the non-U.S. patients for the primary and key secondary endpoints of MACE and hard MACE respectively, uh, significant benefits outside the U.S. So uh, those patients are benefiting too. Uh, within the U.S., though, we found, if anything, larger degrees of benefit for the primary and secondary MACE endpoints, and in fact, found a significant reduction, a 30% relative and 2.6% absolute risk reduction in all-cause mortality in those U.S. We patients. We talked about this uh, yesterday briefly when we chatted, and the question is, why in the U.S. should it be so much better? And the answer right. is, in the U.S., people are just bigger, they have, you know, more risk factors, they, they live not as well, perhaps, as the people in Europe. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that in general. And in the trial as well, of course, we had a dietary recommendations that we told our principal site investigators to give. So hopefully patients were doing the right thing. But in general, you know, the EPA levels were lower in the U.S. than outside the U.S. There was, as you alluded to, more obesity uh, in the U.S. Uh, than uh, outside, and just a lot more risk factors. And in fact, there was a, a fair number of our primary prevention type patients in the U.S. So it wasn't that these were just higher risk in terms of more secondary prevention. Uh, there was also a fair amount of diabetic primary prevention in the U.S. cohort. But they just had a bunch of other risk factors to a greater degree than outside. And I think it's that fact that they were higher risk more than they're being, you know, from the U.S. per se, that demarcated a greater benefit. Okay, so Kim, tell me about uh, icosapan ethyl. Is this good or not? Well, I think the, the trial is very impressive, you know, and, it, and again, it's, a, it's another mechanism for us to go after. Obviously, we still have to deal with cost of agents. New agents are very costly in this country, and that's a challenge. I'm trying to use this drug more and more in my practice because I'm convinced of the data. Uh, but, but hopefully we'll see some breakthrough there, too. Well, I'll make two points quickly, if I can, about that. Just yesterday, Bill Weintraub presented the cost-effectiveness analysis mm -hmm. from reduced as a late breaker and found it to be a dominant strategy, meaning not only effective but cost savings. Uh, and an independent group called ICER also found the drug to be highly cost-effective. And, you know, we'll see what happens, but uh, a couple of days ago at the FDA, uh, an advisory committee met and voted 16-0 in favor of expanding the label. Of course, that's a non-binding vote. The FDA will uh, opine uh, on their own. We'll have to see what they say. But perhaps a label expansion might even help in terms of even I, greater third-party coverage. Yeah, I think it will. You, you think about our Medicare patients hitting that donut hole, and then they may be on six or seven of these cardiovascular agents and other things. And when we add to that, it's a challenge. Yeah, and it's it does cost more, I mean, whether yeah. you like it or not. It does. So one last bit about icosapent ethyl, and that is, you know, it's a good drug. It's uh, very concentrated, but why not just go out and buy 10 pounds of over-the-counter <laughs> fish oil and then take two pounds a day? Right? <laughs> That's a good question. So first of all, to get this level of EPA, you'd have to take, you know, 20, 25 pills a day. And the problem then is you're not even then sure what you're getting because these uh, supplements, a lot of doctors don't realize this, they're not regulated by the U.S. FDA in the way that a prescription medicine is. Prescription medicines are very carefully regulated in the U.S. for purity, you know, for safety and that right. sort of thing, how they're manufactured. The supplements, you can do whatever you want. I mean, there's some broad oversight by the FDA the same way that food is regulated, but not with the same rigor as a prescription medication. But isn't it also true that icosapentaethyl has a differing effect effect on your LDL and HDL compared to just triglycerides? Uh, yes. So, you know, if you're talking about EPA DHA mixtures, uh, right. DHA is believed and has been shown in some studies to raise LDL, so that's right. a potential concern yeah. there. 
Um, so what we studied is a prescription medicine, icosapentethyl, but it's pure EPA, an ethyl ester of EPA, and four right. grams a day of it. And that has no effect on uh, raising LDL. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. raise LDL, maybe has a mild effect in decreasing it. So there you have it, three important trials for day two uh, for everybody out there taking care of patients. These are trials that have clinical impact, and that's a good thing. It is. It's a good thing. Thanks, folks.